Okay, we'll get started. Um, so welcome to the um, online launch of our um, hub and e-learning um, course around LGBTI plus inclusion. Um, I'd just like to um, start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet today and wherever you may be here in Melbourne, proud to play that is the people of the Kulin Nation. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, we do have an Ozan interpreter available for this session, so you can turn on your closed captions um, at the bottom. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, why we're here today and a little bit about leading up to the panel discussion which we have. Um, so my name is Dr Ryan Starr and I'm one of the co-founders of Proud to Play along with James Lollicato. Um, we started Proud to Play four years ago um, with the ultimate aim that we wanted to help the sports sector um, engage in LGBT inclusion and ultimately um, get more LGBTI plus people involved in sport and exercise. Um, Proud to Play has been around for about four years now, which um, has gone very quickly and we've literally um, grew um, and very much that has been down the support of the sports sector. So I know there are a lot of people from the sports sector joining us today. Um, so we'd like to thank you for your continued support. Without your support, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, the need for the resources. So on the Proud to Play website, we have um, a newly launched online hub um, and that will give um, clubs and representatives, volunteers, committee members, the opportunity to download and engage in resources that will help them ultimately enact LGBTI plus inclusion um, within the context of their clubs and organizations. So they're needed very much because one thing that we found in Proud to Play in our, my own research um, in this area is that many clubs and organizations and volunteers want to engage in this area, but they just don't know how. So you can look at it, yes, there is discrimination, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, which is evident, but ultimately we take the other aspect and actually think people do want to engage and people do want to help. Um, everybody loves their sports and they're passionate about them. It gives them a sense of purpose and direction for many, whether it be fans, volunteers, community, um, but ultimately um, they just need a little bit of help. And that's where these resources and information come in because it gives them the support they need. It's absolutely okay that many clubs and organizations don't know this area, they don't know how to engage with it. Um, so that's what these are here for. So they're housed on the Play by the Rules website. Um, thank you to everyone who's been involved in this. It has really been a collaborative effort and um, ultimately from funding through Vic Health. Um, so thank you very much for, continued, for your continued support. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, one thing that we would really love for you to take away as well is that there might be a misconception that LGBTQ LGBTI plus people don't want to engage in sport and that because discrimination and homophobia are quite common, it stops people from engaging. But we know that LGBTI plus people want to play and engage in sport, whether that be through fans, to be a volunteer or to play um, within their daily um, lives. We had one story, um, a young trans boy who's about 16, 17, and when we first did our um, Proud Cricket program with Cricket Victoria, um, they travelled an hour and a half from south of Casey to come and play in central Melbourne just so they could play cricket. So we have lots of stories like that. It's just ultimately LGBTI plus people need to feel um, supported and need to feel that they're playing in a safe environment. So this is a very much welcome first step to encourage people to provide inclusive and safe environments for everybody in their community. Um, sports organisations and volunteers especially are really important to us at Proud to Play um, because for us to achieve our ambitions of um, a world where LGBTI people are leading active and healthy lifestyles through sport and physical activity, um, the, the burden is kind of put on to volunteers. So we absolutely understand that it's a very difficult and critical time for volunteers. So we want to make it as easy as possible for volunteers to find information and engage um, in LGBTI plus inclusion um, so that they can take it back and actually implement it within their clubs. So anybody who is a volunteer currently and is um, doing it tough at the minute and helping kind of their clubs um, keep afloat, we absolutely admire you for that. Um, we think this is a turning point for LGBTI inclusion. Um, 
many years ago, sports organizations wouldn't necessarily engage in this area and they'd be put off and they wouldn't engage. But the fact that we have, for example, our Rainbow Sports Alliance, which is a partnership of several sports organizations in Melbourne, that's growing. And they really come to the table and they want to participate and they want to engage in this area to ultimately cr create and foster um, LGBTI inclusive environments. Um, so where we'll discuss with the panel later, I think we have come to a turning point Right. Um, because it's, it's very common now to discuss these issues and maybe once upon a time sports organizations might bury their head in the sands but ultimately that's not the case now um, and as we've seen with high profile incidents around homophobia but also inclusion um, that's not the reality and ultimately it's our belief that proud to play that by providing inclusive environments for rainbow communities it ultimately can help um, strengthen and develop the sports sector which is inclusive to all people and ultimately attract new fans, new players, new volunteers and the sports sector will be better for it. Um, so I invite you to engage with the resources um, and reach out um, collaborate with us and um, we love partnering with organizations we've recently um, developed um, a partnership with disability sport and recreation where we look to um, use sport to help um, improve the lives of people living with disabilities who are from rainbow communities um, so please get in touch and please engage with the resources um, any feedback is absolutely welcome um, but use it as a as a first step towards your journey of lgbti plus inclusion um, and then hopefully um, we can partner and we can work with you um, moving forwards um, we're now going to hear from dr sandra de Maya, the ceo of vic health who has a few words for us um, around um, these resources Hi, my name is Dr. Sandra DeMeo. I'm the CEO of Vic Health. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that you're on, wherever you are around Victoria or indeed beyond. And I'd also like to acknowledge any First Nations Victorians tuning in to this session. As I said, my name's Dr. Sandro DeMeo and I go by he, him pronouns. Vic Health has a strong commitment to improving the health and well-being of Victorians, particularly those who experience greater barriers to good health, including LGBTIQ plus Victorians. Vic Health recognises participation in sport as a key factor that can influence the health and well-being of the LGBTIQ plus community. However, we know that participation is too often hindered by experiences of discrimination and vilification. Improving awareness and education amongst the sports sector is a key area Vic Health is addressing. Our vision is that all LGBTIQ plus players, officials, officials, supporters, volunteers and employees are welcoming and safe in any sporting facility, ground or environment across our great state. Vic Health is privileged to have worked with Proud to Play on the development of these Australian First resources. We see them as an essential tool to creating more safe, welcoming and inclusive clubs across Victoria and Australia. I encourage all attendees to download the new resources and complete the e-learning course and to share the opportunity throughout your networks. The more the course and resources are used, the greater the positive impact they will have. Continue to think about what you and your organisation can do to progress LGBTIQ plus inclusion. Support is available, including through our new Reimagining Health Grants that are available via the Vic Health website, vichealth.vic.gov.au. Vic Health is offering grants of up to $3,000, $10,000 or $50,000 for local organisations who can support young people or Victorians experiencing disadvantage by creating meaningful social connection, providing opportunities for physical activity, or providing uh, or addressing food insecurity issues. Vic Health congratulates Proud to Play, Southwest Sport, and Play by the Rules in bringing this really important project to life. Enjoy today's tremendous expert panel, and thank you again for your great work to reiterate there um, this was a definitely a collaborative approach um, and thank you very much to our partners um, at Vic Sport, Vic Health, Southwest Sport. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you on these. Um, so now the um, 
formalities are out the way, um, I have the pleasure of introducing my um, friend and colleague, um, Mel Jones, OAM, who has kindly um, agreed to facilitate our wonderful panel coming up. Um, post a playing career with Australian women's cricket team that included two successful World Cup and Ashes campaign, Mel worked in cricket development and sports management before turning to commentary full-time in 2017, including Fox Sports over the Australian summer. A newly appointed director on the board of Cricket Australia, Mel is also a passionate advocate for inclusion and diversity in sport. And Mel has been with us at Proud to Play on our journey from the very start. So she, um, without really knowing us, um, agreed to um, launch Proud to Play um, all those years ago at the MCG. Um, so it's very nice to come full circle again um, and kind of look at where we are now. So um, pleasure to introduce to you. I will hand over to you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Four years, I can't believe it myself. I can remember meeting you and James at a cafe to get my head around what Proud to Play was. And I sat there just being energized by the two of you thinking, do these guys know what they're in for? Do they know that you know, the sport world is tough? Um, and I thought to myself, where are they going to end up? Well, this is where you've ended up, to create this magnificent uh, hub of resources. You've done a power of work, and I know it's not yet done. So first of all, from me to you guys, congratulations. Um, but we're going to get straight into it. I know time is of the essence here today, and we've, we've got such a lot to, to get packed in there as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm hosting this panel from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, at the end of today's session, we have time for question and answers, probably the most important time really, to be honest. Um, can I make sure though, when you're putting your questions in, that you pop it in the Q&A section, not in the chat section? chat section that will make sure that I've got my eyes on those questions. I know most people have found the chat section already, which is fantastic. We're getting messages from Lynn and Warnable and the likes, which is absolutely brilliant. But get involved, find out as much as you possibly can. Today, we have a wonderful mix of industry experience on this panel. People that know what works, knows what doesn't quite work, the ways to bring people along on the journey with them and the ways to tackle the, the hurdles that they approach along the way as well. We will try and find the best fit for all the challenges that you're facing out there in club land and association land. Uh, to tackle the topic of LGBTI inclusion, we're going to do it from three different angles today. The first one is breaking new ground and our panellists today have created a whole new space in uh, the advancement of LGBTI plus uh, sports inclusion. And this is vitally important. I cannot stress this enough because the research does show us that this is one of the most neglected areas of inclusion. The second area we're going to tackle is pushing the boundary. So you've created that new space and you're breaking a couple of boundaries, but now all of a sudden you don't want to just plateau out. You want to keep making sure that we can keep pushing forward. So what's next? What are some of the new resistances you might find as you're going along this journey? And the last one is all about athlete activism. Athletes more and more are finding their voice, which is absolutely wonderful. And we're going to talk about the impact that is going to have on inclusion as well. Let's get into introducing you to my four amazing guests today. Our first guest, Craig Tiley, is the Chief Executive Officer of Tennis Australia. Throughout his time at the organisation, he has been a vocal supporter of the LGBTI plus communities participating in tennis. His drive and the organisation's actions in this space saw Tennis Australia earn the award for the highest ranking organisation in Australia at the 2019 Pride in Sport Awards. I'm going to have to have a little chat to Cricket Australia about that one. You've got some challenges coming up, Cray. No real surprise um, coming off the back of creating an international first at the Australian Open, the LGBTI plus tennis tournament, the Glam Slam. Craig, is it fair to say that the Glam Slam is now the fifth major Grand Slam of the summer? Yeah, and soon to be the fourth. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's great. We're, very, we're excited to host it and it's, uh, it's been magnificent. You know, participants from around the world. Brilliant. 
Welcome. Uh, looking forward to having a chat Thanks, to you. Man. Our second guest, Moana Hope, is uh, a professional footballer who's played with both Collingwood and North Melbourne in the AFLW and is also a very proud Nike ambassador as well. Mo has a powerful voice in the football arena in her stance against homophobia in sport and is widely regarded as a role model for many young LGBTI plus people for her strength in sharing her message. Mo, along with her wife Isabella, about to welcome their first child into this world this year. So a little bit of nerves probably for the first time, Mo. Now, professional footballer, I coached you in cricket many, many years ago, and I know so many people were just jealous of the amount of talent you had. I want to know, though, the big question is, how's your backhand and will you be registering for the next Glam Slam? I actually love tennis. Like, I don't know what it is, but I love tennis. But this last, like, oh, probably six months, I've been down at the park just playing against the ball by myself. Love it. So I'm off. I'm there. I'm Here down. <laughs> I can't say I'm good. I don't think I'm good. Oh, damn, Craig. <laughs> I can't say I'm any good, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> I'm sure you're pretty good. Brilliant. Uh, our third guest is Dr. Ruth Jeans, is an associate professor in the Faculty of Education at Monash University. Her research focuses on the use of sport and recreation as a community development resource, particularly to address the social exclusion amongst marginalised groups such as LGBTI communities. Now, Ruth, we've chatted a little bit over the last couple of days. Now, I think when most people hear associate professor and research, everyone gets sometimes they, you know, oh, you know, what's going to happen here? But I feel, and I don't know if it, this is going to embarrass you, you're not going to like this, but I feel as if almost you're bringing sexy back to research. Like, <laughs> really good stuff going on, isn't there? <laughs> oh, there's definitely a lot of great stuff going on in this space at the moment and a lot of um, good research on how we can make sport more inclusive. So, yeah, hopefully get some interest <laughs> back and see the value of research in driving it forward. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. No problem now. Either. There we go. <laughs> and our fourth and final guest. Well, in 2019, Andy Brennan became the first Australian professional men's soccer player to come out as gay. Since then, he's become a vocal supporter of LGBTI plus inclusion in sport, recreation and physical activity and has become a positive role model for inclusion in the sport of football. Andy is also on the right team. And by that, I mean he's a board member of Proud to Play as well. Andy, from athlete to decision maker and vision creator on the board, how proud are you to, to join Proud to Play? Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really good. And also an eye-opener for me because obviously I came from not knowing a lot to coming out and then all this new information. So it's, it's been a really good journey for me. And yeah, we look forward to doing more in the future. A little bit of information overload or can we handle it? <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> You're an athlete. You'll take it all in like a sponge, I know. Okay, let's get into things, guys. We're going to talk about the first area I'd love to talk about is the whole topic of breaking new ground. Um, I think probably over the last few years, it feels as if that new ground has really been probably shaking the cage a little bit and creating quite a bit of space and, and conversation in this area. Craig, I might start with you. Um, LGBTI plus inclusion has been something that you've made a priority at Tennis Australia. For an organisation to take, someone to say, sort of the brave leap forward into this space, they can look at it probably from two ways. One is it's the right thing to do. And the other one is probably it's the smart thing to do. So whether or not you look at it as a, an equality space or, you know, commercially a viable one, do organisations, should they look at one more the, than the other or should it be a nice mix of the two? I think it's a good question. I think it's a mix. We've approached it as a mix in tennis. Um, and in fact, Brian just did some magnificent research uh, on, um, on for, for tennis and as it relates to uh, particularly inclusion. And, and you know, to, so to, when we talk to Ruth here shortly, to be able to take that data and then to be able to talk to your volunteers, we have 2,500 clubs across Australia, mostly volunteer driven, about 1.6 million people playing the game. And uh, unless we have an environment, the game's not going to grow unless we have an environment where it's a safe environment and uh, you can go to a club and you can be who you want to be. You are what you are. And the only time you feel a bit different is if you serve a double fault and lose the game, not, not for any other reason. And, <laughs> and so we've really focused on that, but it's having the resources is absolutely magnificent, but then there's a big bridge to cross to take those resources and make them actionable and make them sustainable. And so we're on that journey. So we're in all those clubs across the country and ensuring that we can, these resources will continue to grow, but that we're not just, you know, posting a bunch of resources to clubs, but we're on the ground working with the clubs 
uh, yeah. to ensure they're creating those safe environments. And then, and then the other option we have, Mel, is of course, you mentioned earlier, is that why not take advantage of a magnificent platform we have? We have a global platform in the Australian Open, and uh, that is, you know, for us to celebrate the great virtues of our sport of tennis and everyone does and how to keep everyone healthy, uh, we're open for everyone. And we, we play on the word open very specifically because that's our brand and, and, uh, and we want people to feel safe in that environment and hence the Glam Slam, which many people on this call have had a lot to do with and have driven it. And it has become very quickly a, you know, a shining light for many. Most definitely. Ruth, I might come to you here. Um, we mentioned at the start that it has been a neglected area. I guess, why do you think that has been? And potentially, what's the hesitancy behind groups or associations in, in getting into this space? Um, thanks, Mel. Yeah, I guess it's um, been seen as more of a hidden issue, I suppose, within sport and particularly in community sport as something that we don't necessarily have to deal with this aspect of inclusion and it's you know i think behind this sort of banner of everyone's welcome and just this sort of uh, the hidden notion of kind of gender and sexuality in sports context so um there just i guess hasn't been the explicit focus on it and it's something that we really sort of you know, has come, I guess, to the forefront, particularly in the last five years of thinking, well, yeah, this is an area we do really need to focus on and starting to actually get some initiatives going. I guess in, in terms of the hesitancy, I think with all aspects of inclusion, there's always fear associated with offending people, doing the wrong thing, making things worse. And I think we can see that across all um all different groups but particularly in this space i think um within community sport in particular there's a real worry amongst volunteers of doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing um which is why you know resources such a proud to play have been doing are just so important in trying to help overcome some of that fear and hesitancy and given the tools and the language and the strategies to begin to start working towards more inclusive sporting spaces yeah, it is a tough one, isn't it, that whole fear factor. Can you just quickly, because I've seen some of the, the research you've done, and there's a couple of big, big benefits, though, to clubs if they, if they do take this on. Oh, massively. I, I mean, I think there's benefits, you know, there's benefits to everyone in sport, welcoming inclusive spaces that people feel safe in. It's great for everyone, not just um, LGBTI plus communities. It, it really helps everyone. So take that as your first benefit. Your club's a nicer place. It's a nicer place to be in for everyone, um, which is so important. But there's other, you know, really tangible benefits from being more inclusive in terms of, you, know, you can drive your membership up so you get more members in, more people see you as a place that, you know, they want to be in the local community. Things like um, gaining sponsorship, it opens up access to alternative forms of funding, potentially, if you're seen as an inclusive club access to more grants, access to develop facilities, you know, the, the more you're kind of doing in this space, the more appealing you are for public funding to in, enhance what you can offer. So um, I think across the board, you know, it's an, an absolute win-win for everyone in terms of hopefully LGBTI people feel more welcome in the spaces and want to play sport, but there's such great benefits for the club as well. One of those clubs that has engaged in it and done so well is the Darabin Falcons. I think anyone involved in, in women's football would probably know that, that phrase. Mo, you played with them. It was, it's probably one of the most supportive clubs going around. Um, and then all of a sudden, you go from this really supportive environment to when AFLW sort of just went boom, and you got yourself into a completely new environment as well. Clubs, um, AFL clubs around Australia starting to have women's and girls teams coming in. Yet, they haven't come from this kind of community before, so it's a whole new area for them. How important do you see resources like this in terms of getting people engaged in and comfortable with um, opening up their clubs? It's super important. The one thing I, I do miss the most, and I did miss the most playing AFL, was club level. I think because it is, you do have that more sense of like community. You are around a lot more people. You do see everyone's families come. It's just that family feel rather than footy where it's like you're on a bus and you're locked in a room and you're not sure if you can talk to people. And I don't know, you just, that's one thing I was really looking forward to this year was playing some local footy just, just because of that, just because of those, just those feels you get when you're down at the club. 
Completely. Well, I hope you get back to, I hope we all get out to local footy this year at some stage in cricket and the likes. Um, Andy, you took breaking new ground to a whole new level last year. So well done you. Um, I'd like to ask you, you've had the experience of not being out and now being out in the sport. How's that changed for you as an athlete? Did you, did you find that it actually improved the way in which you were training and playing the game? How big a shift was it for you? I think probably the biggest shift for me personally was that I, I stopped kind of questioning myself. Like I, I, before coming out, I, I would always go to training and I'd probably think about being gay like six or seven times while at training. And, you know, whether it was in the, in the change room, thinking about what people would think and, and kind of just being a little bit uncomfortable. And then even when you go out on the field as well, you, you kind of, I'd always second guess myself back then compared to what I do now. Like I kind of feel like it's somehow changed the way I think and I've got that confidence. Um, mm. and I think it's largely due to the fact that I accept myself a lot more now than obviously what I do then. Like I, I have complete, not like completely open and honest about my sexuality now, which I think is, has come a long way. And I think one of the things that's helped me get there is the fact that there's been so much support from the clubs and the players and my friends and, and all the people in my life and everyone that I've kind of come across, whether it's, you know, the governance or, or proud to play these kinds of organizations that have really helped me accept myself and be able to play. And now I go to training and now I'm, you know, kind of playing and, doesn't uh, it, it crosses my mind still like I think about these things but I don't think about it with the same fear and kind of or oh, will they kind of accept me or what are they going to do it's more the like yeah this is me and I don't really yeah. care I'm kind of proud of it now I'm kind of as if I wear it like as a badge and yeah. I think that's a really cool thing to be able to, to be able to come from where like obviously you feel as if you, you feel pretty crappy a lot of the time to going in now and now wearing it and being like I've got the support of a lot of people I've got the support kind of of myself now as well because of that um, I think that's yeah probably the, the biggest difference in terms of the sport and actually playing now. That's a lot of headspace yeah. to be taking up, <laughs> isn't it? Change, yeah. Do, do, you, do you sometimes think I could have been this type of player if I'd come out earlier and used all that headspace into, into another area? Well, it, I've, I've thought about it before because like, it is so consuming. Like The amount of times you think about it and I wonder as well, like, if people had a go at me or said something, I kind of took it personally all the time. And I, now I, I just kind of brush it off or I, I don't really think about it. And I wonder if I didn't have, you know, that constant thought about being gay and being worried about it and what people would think. I wonder if that would have been different. Yeah. You know, playing my whole way through. It would yeah. have been nice. <laughs> Wow. Um, each of you have been leaders in um, inclusion. You've all got such powerful voices in, in a variety of different ways. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that collectively, though, we've still got a long way to go and we can't sort of rest on our laurels by any sense of the imagination. I'd like to get a sense of you, um, what's exciting you most about your space at the moment, um, but also how you're finding that you can actually push that envelope a little bit more particularly in and around some resistance to this change. Um, Ruth, I might start with you here. One-off events are fantastic because it creates a spotlight. Um, the Pride Cup has certainly done a lot of that. How do you make sure that one-off events at Clubland or Association isn't just that one moment in time and that, that you can continue the messaging right throughout the season? Yeah, great question, Mel. I'm so... I think, um, as we've seen with the, the research we've done with the Pride Cup, um, one-off events are fantastic in terms of being that initial driver of raising some awareness and getting people engaged in the club space in this area of inclusion. And it provides like a really good format for doing that and then having that engagement and that initial education. In terms of carrying it on um, and, and overcoming resistance, I guess what we've been seeing and, and comes across in all sort of research in the diversity and inclusion area is that importance of the individual champion. So that, that person or ideally a few people within a club that are just really passionate and committed about the space and really wanting to take it forward. And I see time and time again, those people are so critical in overcoming resistance. So, you know, they'll, They'll work with their club committees, they'll get everyone on board, they'll talk to individual players or, or coaches who might seem a bit resistant and begin to, to break that down and to see why that's happening. 
so really just just having those key people and i think for for us at a higher level and the people within sporting organizations how do we support those champions and make sure that you know we look after them and they don't get burnt out as well is is key you know yeah. in resistance yeah it can be quite draining can't it so mm. you need to protect those energy levels um andy i think one of the big things and you know i'm quite still heavily involved in in club land is that communication and language is such an important part of this process um things like in terms of um, subtle jokes, oh, you know, he, she didn't mean it, um, that's just the way they are, those kinds of comments all the time that aren't picked up or, or stopped. Um, and the other one I want to talk to you about in terms of um, communication is asking if, any, if someone's okay, if you ask once, they'll probably go, yeah, no, it's okay, I'm okay. But if you ask a few more times, you actually might get down to the real sort of understanding of how they are actually traveling in the club as well so how do you as a player look at language and communication in terms of making a club inclusive yeah i think it's i think it's probably one of the biggest things um in making a club a club inclusive um i, I had an experience where um we, we were at training and a player said something which was derogatory towards me and um being gay and he didn't mean it um, and I didn't actually hear it, but one of my fellow players, the teammates, did hear it. And he um, <laughs> he picked the ball up in the middle of training and like booted it like two fields down. And I kind of just looked at him and like, what what are you what are you doing? I didn't didn't really know what was going on. And it was kind of something that he would do anyway. So we just carried on training. But I I later found out what the guy had said because he came and told me and just kind of said sorry, didn't mean it. And I think that that kind of pulling up and and saying no, like that that language isn't okay. And obviously that in that manner, he kind of showed everyone that that wasn't okay. But whether it's big or whether it's small, I think that it's really important to tell people why the language isn't all right. And I think for so long, like me growing up in, in Tasmania, um, it was just common. Like people would say these words and say these things that kind of built this environment where, at least to me, it got to the point where I felt like it wasn't okay to be gay. And now looking back, that's just a crazy thought that through people, the way they act and where they speak, it kind of creates that, you know, kind of deep inner grain where I, I can't be gay. Oh, I'm not allowed to be gay. It's, it's not right to play football and be gay, which is, is so wrong now looking back. Um, and so I think that that's probably one of the biggest things that to see teammates do that now and to see other friends and people kind of stick up for you or, or become an ally or, or do things that kind of make you proud. It's like, wow, like that makes a huge difference. And it makes, mm. yeah, it, it would be so big for so many people, especially people that find it hard uh, to accept themselves if they have those people around them that are, you know, kind of batting for them. I think it's really, really important. Completely. Mo, you've been in this situation before. Um, some have been well documented, others not. It's just sort of day-to-day -day life kind of thing. But how how tough is it? And Andy mentioned Tasmania. I think of Hannah Gadsby and her chats about um, in the net about leaving tension in the room. And, and sometimes you have to to almost force people to be a little bit uncomfortable so that you can actually open up the conversation a little bit. How, how have you found, it must have been a tough one for you because all of a sudden, again, we mentioned thrust into the limelight. Did you really think about it or you just did you just go to town? No, I, I think that, you know, going into the AFR, I didn't think it would be as big a, um, I guess, I think the issue for me more was more when we played games, so like the crowd. So the crowd would be, you know, um, one of the most insults I would get would be around the fact that I'm gay. Um, and that would be yelled out in a negative term, like something like you stupid lesbian or something like that. It's like, imagine if I went to a men's game and yelled out to Paddy Dangerous, Dangerfield, uh, you're stupid straight. Like it just doesn't make sense. But then I think about all the kids that are in the in the crowd, like all the young girls and them hearing that kind of language and thinking, wait, is that bad? Like, is that negative? Is is that, you know, why is they, you know, they're the kind of things that I really couldn't get my head around and something that I, you know, all I could do was continue being me, but something that I hope changes because that kind of stuff you know, me as an, you know, an, an older player, um, not, not, you know, I feel like I'm still young, but as an older player, you know, I've, I've been through a lot, so sticks and stones, but I'm worried about the younger girls who, you know, might have not have come out yet or, you know, mm -hmm. might not have that, that strength. So I think that was something that was, I found really difficult. Yeah. Did you think that with the crowd, so I'm going off track here, I apologise to Ryan, he knows I do this a little bit, do you think the crowd, when they come along to a game, an AFLW game, were there to support you and this was just, 
the default mechanism to try and put you off? Or do you think they actually went there with a purpose? Oh, I can't answer because I don't know. But like, it didn't happen at every game. I can be honest, it didn't happen at every game. And the, the one thing I love about the AFOW is that community sense with the crowds. Like, there's always a lot of kids and picnics and um, families. And I love that. And I don't want, you know, I don't want that negative, angry, um, uh, like, I guess, ways that, that are currently being in the crowds of the men's game. I don't want that to transition over to the women's game because I feel like, um, it's got its own new thing now and I want to want to love to keep it that way. And I definitely wouldn't want it to be about, you know, someone's sexuality or how they look or who they are, who they love. I just don't want that to be a thing. Yeah. You've just given me an idea for a whole new segment as well. So thank you for that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to come to you. I used um, Cricket Australia did a, a panel the other day on, on racism in sport coming off the back of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the analogy I use, which I think is quite fitting in this space as well, is when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So for, for Tennis Australia, the, the Glam Slam is, and the Australian Open has shifted its environment to allow people to come in as they are and embrace who they are, which I think is absolutely magnificent. How do you then take that and filter it down to, to club level? You've got the expertise and the money. It's so much harder now for a volunteer space to be able to do the same thing. I think it is. I think it, it, it starts with, I mean, just, you know, um, well, you know what Andy and Moe both mentioned, I mean, it does start with the language, both verbal and nonverbal, and that's the foundation of culture. It's a culture at every club. And, uh, and I think it's the responsibility is on us is to get that right. And that takes education, communication. That's why these resources, the research is ongoing is critically important. And then if you have some aspirational voices uh, like Mo's and like Andy's and others, that, that certainly can add to the journey that you're going on. Interestingly, in tennis, we've had a long journey of the woman being far more braver and honest than the men. Um, and uh and you know we've had we've we've recently had some male tennis players come out but after their careers you know several five six years after their careers and mm -hmm. and uh so i don't even as a sport as inclusive as we are we still don't have it completely right in many ways uh, we have the margaret court issue we have you know we, we, there are a number of issues but we, it's just you, you have to keep uh, you don't bat it away. You've got to keep getting inside and keep working on it and changing the environment. And there's techniques to do it. I don't have all the answers, but I'm hungry to find out and learn from the best um, because there are others have some great answers out there too. And but we, we will, and you know, when it comes to pushing the boundaries, I think the biggest thing I'll say, and, and lots of NSOs don't do this and, and, um, and state organizations, you have to invest in it. You have to invest and you have to invest money in it and you have to invest time in it. And you have to make it a priority and it has to be a strategic pillar. And it's just not a nice thing to do. It's a commercially smart thing to do. And, uh, and I think when people realize that they can approach it that way, then I think it starts, it starts to shift it. Yeah. Um, you've now just given me another idea for more <laughs> topics to discuss. I'm going to stay on the track though, stay on script Jones, because we're getting close to the point where we will throw it open to, uh, to question and answers too. So if you haven't got your question down, please, Please pop it down, your name and your association, and I will pass it on to our panellists. Um, we're going to move into the athlete activism, the, the finding your voice space here. It's probably been one of the biggest shifts in sport, and I think probably social media has played a, a massive part in that as well in, in terms of allowing a platform to get your thoughts um, and ideas and expressions out about what you're passionate about. Um, Naomi Osaka... Casa Semenya, the World Rugby Ban on Trans Athletes have been prime examples over um, athlete activism. Mo, you've been more than vocal and numerous times against uh, homophobia in sport. Um, I'd, I'd like to, this might be a little bit of a weird one, but in terms of backlash, and we've spoken a little bit about it, have you got backlash from your own community on the way in which you've gone about it or the things that you've said? Um, I don't know, actually, I don't think I have. I think that I, I get a lot of messages, but it's messages of thank you for being you that's allowed me to be me. Um, because, you know, the fact that you can be so open and proud of who you are, I was able to come out to my parents or, you know, I was, you know, they're, they're the kind of things that I get, which I never thought I'd ever get stuff like that. But I think that's quite beautiful, but I, nothing negative. Like I, um, you know, I try and I try to do everything that's 
very me and, and unapologetic. And if that relates with people, I think that's a really nice thing. Is there a weight of expectation and responsibility? Do you feel that being a voice? No, because I, I never went into this going, I'm, I'm going to be this leader um, or I'm going to be, I'm going to be the people's voice. I'm just like, I'm Mo, uh, I'm in love with a woman and I love sports and um, I've got a pretty crazy family. Um, and if you like me, cool. If you don't, well, that's fine as well. Um, so it's, it's like a, in that way, I'm not letting myself down, you know, because at the start I did get really um, upset. People said to me, I don't like you. I'd be like, why, what did I do? But then I kind of just got to the point where I'm like, well, you know, I'm just me. So, and that's okay. Nice dog too, by the way. Oh. Um, they, <laughs> coming into the Australian Open, um, we've mentioned that athletes are finding their voice more and more. As um, CEO who's leading a, a major tournament like this, do you get nervous or excited for the fact that this is becoming more and more part of big events? No, I get excited because I think we, our job is to create the environment where athletes can have that voice. Uh, and then, And I look at that as my job. Uh, my job is to create a safe environment where an athlete has that voice. Yeah. Uh, we want to we want to broadcast it, um, and uh, there are there are some crazy rules that and Andy knows this. Mo knows there's some crazy rules which restrict you on having a voice because uh, organisations feel that they want to protect themselves commercially in their messaging. And uh, I have a different view, which is not necessarily always the view of the majority, but I have a different view on that and using it as a platform for that voice and. Uh, and I think, I, I think that's important. And if you're in a leadership role, um, I look at that as just a simple responsibility that you have. Yeah. And then how important is your relationship with your commercial partners too about the understanding of your stance on this? Yeah, I think, you, I think it's, you, it's communication and uh, they need to understand when they sign up with you as an organization. We, we consider ourselves disruptors and accelerators. Uh, so as the Australian Open, we, we used to be the fourth cousin of all the major Grand Slams. We now consider ourselves as the as the uh, as the naughty child, the naughty elder child, um, but uh, I think the approach is is um, you just got to communicate and bring them along on the journey with you. And I and I do think it's important. I mean, we have a, we do have some great athletes that are activists in their voice, and and I'll never not provide them an environment to be able to speak that uh, speak that message. Yeah, that is absolutely wonderful to hear, Ruth. Um, it's not just important for young LGBTI plus um, athletes and people to hear these these voices, but I think it's also just as important for the allies to hear the messages as well. Is that what the research is showing? Yeah, absolutely. And just the, the critical importance of allies and um, certainly um, as, as Andy's indicated, just how powerful that can be having people mm -hmm. alongside you and also sort of really pushing these messages home. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's, there's a role for everyone, not just in terms of athletes as, as activists and LGBTI plus athletes, but, you know, everyone can be an activist in this space um, and important to encourage people to do that. Andy, Craig mentioned before that there is uh, an obvious difference between men's and women's sport in this space. Men, the men's sport arena and, and environment seems to be a lot quieter. What, why do you think that is? I don't know. Maybe it's to do with you know growing up and the, the derogatory stuff that was said, and it has that, that's kind of created that environment. Um, it, it's kind of a difficult one to say, but like I, I think with with athletes speaking out, I think it's really important. I think there was maybe a year ago where Anton Griezmann, who was playing for Barcelona, said something like, "If he had a teammate that came out, it wouldn't change a thing for him." And um, you know, he's a top top player, so that kind of stuff's really important. You know, athletes speaking out, especially of, of that magnitude. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw one at you here, Andy, uh, without warning here. So apologies, but not really, because I'd like to see your answer. <laughs> uh, Lionel Messi, best footballer in the world. What would be a bigger impact, Lionel Messi coming out or Lionel Messi deciding to be the number one ally for LGBTI plus inclusion? Oh, um, I think both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think if I had to split and pick one, I think obviously if he came out, it'd be, it'd, it'd, it'd be um, oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think if I was 16 and, and I saw someone like Messi either, you know, come out himself or, or be, you know, the biggest ally, I think it would just be huge. I think it would make yeah. such a big impact. Um, yeah. and it would change a lot of people's perspectives on, on what it's like to be gay and, and, and that he can play. So I think, 
either of them will take. <laughs> Let him know, please. Anyone else want to chime in with an answer there or a, a thought? Craig, you can both. I, I, it's the, it's the, to Andy's point, I think um, Mandy will answer that best, but I think it's the profile again. This is the message to the youth. Uh, and Mo keeps talking about that too. And I think that's, that's our critical responsibility. Again, in a leadership role, ours is to, our, I look at my responsibility is to, is to ensure that, that everything you possibly do is to be a safe environment for all. And, uh, and you actually got to go beyond what you would normally do to create that because in some cases it's far behind and people's attitudes are, are still kind of stuck in the mud and, uh, and you've got to shift them. Okay, we, uh, we're time sticking away really quickly. I want from each of you, um, just your, your key takeaway for the people listening in on how to be the perfect ally. Andy? Um, I think just being visible and, and, and asking questions. I think there's a lot of things that I don't know and I've come out and, and I'm gay and I still don't know. And I think asking questions and talking to people and being open and honest is the biggest thing that you can do because it includes everyone. It makes people more honest. It gets people's opinions and it starts mm -hmm. people sharing and discussing the issue. And I think that's the only way to go forward. There's not one answer. There's not one way to do things. I think it's a collective issue and it's a collective, um, well, the club is a collective as well. And if you work together with everyone in the club to, to try and move forward, I think that's the biggest thing of being a good ally. Yep. Mo, how do you be an ally? How do you make me follow that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't make it the last one, because that's going to be the hardest. Oh, oh you should have started with me now, man. Come on, cool friend. Um, oh, I think for me personally, if I just go, go off experience with club footy and stuff like that, I think I was just always accepted for who I was, but then I was never made felt different. So nobody ever made a point of me being gay or no one ever made, you know, never asked questions of, of you know me as a person so i think for me it's just all about acceptance without being judged and i think that that's really important and then yeah whatever whatever andy said <laughs> i wrote it down but Thank you. whatever he said i like it <laughs> i i'll take andy and mo's answers for mine um but uh no i think ask the ask the question uh is this a, is this a safe environment for all yeah and uh and and i think it has to be absolutely, we have to be absolutely focused on that. And so, yeah. And then people walk on eggshells, just to Andy's point, be honest, open, talk about it. And talk about it is the, is the biggest thing we encourage. Yeah. Ruth, you've got the hard one, not Mo. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think one of the key things is being willing as an ally to question poor behavior or terminology and language and being willing to say and that you know doesn't always have to be done in a confrontational way can just be and particularly when you're dealing with young people who maybe don't understand the impact of their language just sort of why you know why are you saying that and where's that coming from and being prepared to do that educational work is, is really important yeah brilliant um, team, thank you so much for answering my questions. We're going to throw it open uh, to the audience now. Um, and sorry, I'm just glancing through them as we, as we click, quickly go. So the first question is from Stella. And I might just bring Ryan, he's back in with us because I'm tipping he'll get a few questions as well. Um, Ryan, I might just get you to unmute yourself so we hear all your wonderful answers at some stage. Um, Bush Rangers basketball. In your experience, what is one key recommendation you would make to sporting clubs to avoid LGBTI plus inclusion initiatives being viewed as tokenistic? Um, Ryan, I might, might bring you back in straight away. Yeah, that's an interesting one because it comes up in my research a lot. So um, often sports say we want to do it authentically. We don't want to be tokenistic, but often people might say that as an excuse for action. So it's like, oh, we don't want to be tokenistic, so we're not going to do anything. Um, there have been some instances, I think, where let's say the LGBTI plus community has called some organizations out when maybe on one hand, they are kind of claiming they're inclusive. And then on the other hand, they have inexclusive practices. So I think people can see when something is authentic and it's meant um, for the right reasons. And as Craig was saying, it's absolutely important to have both the social justice perspective and mm. the business sense. Because at the end of the day, I always say this, um, if you're a sport, why wouldn't you want more players, more fans, more people posting on social media? We're about 10% of the population. To not include them, it, it's bad business. And there's a lot of research from America that actually shows that. Yeah. Does anyone else want to add 
flavour to that reply. Happy with that, Andy? Yep, me too. There we go. <laughs> okay, this, one, this one is from Craig. This is from one of the founding members of Proud to Play in James. So it'll be, it'll be a tricky one here, Craig. Um, SSOs and NSOs have been fairly slow to see the importance and market of LGBTI plus inclusion. What personally gave you the drive to get into this space? And how can we encourage other sports organisations to see the importance? What would you say to them? I think from a, um, one, of, one of the key um, values that I've lived my whole life and that we've adopted in the organization is that of, of humility and empathy. And, and, uh, and I think it's not about you, it's about creating the environment for others. So, so I, I've always looked at it that way. But did Ryan said that Ryan's got it will spend hours and hours of the research and can confirm it is that it, it is a good business decision. Um, it's, a, it's a community that's a very large, impactful community. Um, so if, you, if you're not going to be inclusive, if you're not going to go down this direction, you're going to lose. Okay. Um, this is from Liv from Working It Out. And this one's to Andy. What could your first club, South Hobart, have done differently to help you feel more comfortable being out as a young gay person playing football? Um, I, th I think largely what we've been speaking about, just being um, a club that shows that they are open and, and, and accepting of all um, people. And it's not that they weren't. I think that's the key thing. It's not that South Hobart weren't, you know, not open and not on. Like, it wasn't inclusive. They, they were like very inclusive. I think it's just the space and the time um, growing up in that period, I think, and maybe in Tassie a little bit, was the fact that that's just the, the environment. And now I think clubs are doing more things to make it more inclusive. And I think that that in itself would have been massive that, um, you know, if, if you saw that there were rainbow flags and they, they celebrated pride uh, rounds and things like that, I think is really important. The little things in making it um, just, just seen, I suppose. I think that's something yeah. small that you can do and um, be impactful. Yeah. So it's, it's the visibility of things yeah. as well yeah. as the... And it's, 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 I suppose it's kind of an easy and, and somewhat enjoyable thing to do as well. Like it's, it brings people together and it's a kind of event thing for the club. Like there's so many positives that come from it. Yeah, completely. Um, next question is from Gemma. One of the things I hear a lot is that because grassroots sporting clubs rely on volunteers to run, they already have so much to juggle that inclusion work isn't a priority. How can this be addressed when their capacity to engage is so low? Ruth, I might throw that one to you to start with. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a really good point and obviously a key issue with community sport and um, just what volunteers are able to do. And it is such a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. To me, the central thing here is the messaging and how we promote this to community sport volunteers in that it, you know, it shouldn't be in opposition to core work. It shouldn't be seen as, you know, working towards inclusion, taken away from the core business of the club. Mm -hmm. And that's often the perception it is. But actually, it, you know, it really complements it. Inclusive clubs are usually successful clubs, you know, on all fronts in terms of competitive success, of membership, of revenue generation. So I think if we can start reframing this, if this isn't something extra that you have to do this is yep. something that's central to the operations of a, a well-performing and successful club um we'll probably get more kind of uptake there and i, I hate to sort of selling things along the kind of business message but it you know it can really help the club out so i think you know it, we can position it as helping volunteers achieve the goals that they have anyway and not seen as extra work then we can really gain some traction in this space yeah. Uh, the next question, question is from Stella again, and it, it sort of brings to the point that um, Mo was making before about supporters. Um, at a club community sport level, we find it difficult to communicate inclusion messaging to our spectators, where players understand inclusion, but the crowd don't have that access to inclu inclusion messaging. What are some practical ways to cut through to spectators? This is a pretty tough one, actually. Craig, have you thought about that from a... Yeah, I Nearly every community club has a website. On the front page of the website, put a rainbow flag and put an athlete story every single time. It's the front page. It's not mm -hmm. hidden down on page number five. Uh, when someone comes into the club, they need to see the first thing that they walk in. It needs to be visual and it yeah. needs to be the story of the athletes telling that. And, uh, and the spectators will be a journey and they'll eventually learn. And that's just a part of it. I'm sure there are other ideas, but that's the approach we've taken. 
Yeah. I mean, I know grounds in all sporting organisations have the, the audio that goes around talking about discrimination. It, it sometimes feels as if that's yeah. a, a wash over these days because you... Yeah, I agree. It, yeah. It's got to be a combination of a whole bunch of things. Okay. One thing that for me seems just like a, a check mark thing. This is, it has to be, it's yeah. a combination. And, uh, um, and every avenue, every communication angle you can have, it's changing behaviors. I've always said in coaching, when I used to coach, is that the pain of change is greater than the pain of losing. And uh, so change is hard. Um, and that's why it's a journey. We're going to all be doing it. Okay. If you could coach anyone on the tour at the moment, who would it be? Roger Federer's going to do anything. <laughs> didn't have to think about that one too no, long. <laughs> no, 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 I think uh, my favorite is Ash Barty, of course, but uh, um, you know, but again, you know, I think she picked up the played the golf club championships this weekend and won it. Um, so yeah. she can do anything. Played first year of WBBL cricket, cricket yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> one of those athletes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question here from uh, Catherine Gurley, it's a bit of a long one, but um, vitally important. Hi, all, thank you so much for your amazing insight. I'm the president of the Community Women's Softball Club, and we have a high proportion of lesbian members. However, I'm trying to actively increase our inclusivity for transgender diverse players. For all club mem members, there are no issues with having openly out gay players and committee members. However, I feel like the next step, inverted commas, into welcoming non-binary and trans members will be more of a challenge to navigate. Do you have any advice? How can I ensure that we continue to provide a safe and welcoming space? Absolutely brilliant question. Um, Ryan? Yeah, so yep. one of our core pieces of work is going to be around trans and gender diverse inclusion. We've seen some really great inroads around sexuality in particular, um, but we still have a long way to go. And I'm sure most people are aware of some of the issues um, out there. JK Rowling is keeping on going with some of her um, kind of abuse towards the community. And unfortunately, what we need to really think about is how do we get the correct information and education out there? Because people might formulate ideas around trans and gender diverse athletes, um, things around cheating and all those terrible things. So what we need to do is really reset everybody and actually give them the correct information um, because probably what they've heard, if they've seen it on Twitter or whatnot, they're just kind of ultimately being brainwashed to think a certain way. So it's kind of giving information and ultimately um, providing safe environments because it can really help trans and gender diverse people with their mental health. So look, this is an area that is um, under-researched. There's um, not as much going on, but hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll be leading that. So one thing I would just recommend is um, get educated, look where your sources are coming from um, and partner with a range of organizations. There's Transgender Victoria, there's ourselves, Y Gender, um, there's lots of there. So I'll definitely say, look, it maybe is a difficult um, area for some to engage in. So get that help, it's absolutely fine. Right. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I'm mindful that we're a minute away from 11 o'clock here. So I'm just, I'm going to ask one more question from the, the list of questions here, Ryan, then I'm going to pass it back to you. Um, this is a good one too, because as a, I don't know how I ever became a teacher, but I was, so I'm very interested in the education of, of young people. Is the Proud to Play resources going to be made available to all schools, primary and secondary? We need to start the education and learning process as early as possible. That's from Helen Croxford. It's back to you, Ryan. Yeah, so oh, interesting. Great segue there, because we actually have another e-learning course directed to P teachers. <laughs> so whoever sent that question, thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, so in a couple of weeks' time, we'll actually be launching that because um, it will be an education resource exactly like the Play by the Rules one, but specifically directed towards P teachers. And we had the wonderful Ruth Jeans actually help with that resource as well. Um, so I don't know if, Ruth, you have any comments around what that might look like? Yeah, I mean, again, it's just sort of um, very practical introduction and some of the key strategies and steps that HPE teachers can, can take to be more inclusive in that setting. So, um, yeah, looking forward to getting those out as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, from my side, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to pass over to Ryan in a second. Can I please thank from personally, but also on behalf of everyone that's been uh, tuning in today to, to Craig, Mo, Andy and Ruth. Thank you so much for your, your time, your honesty, your energy in, in chatting about this. Um, I've learned lots already and we'll be passing things on, um, but have a wonderful summer. I hope the Australian Open just goes off tap and particularly the Grand Slam. 
be looking forward to seeing Mo with the uh, killer backhand at the Grand Glam Slam as well. So keep, keep an eye out there. She's a wild card. She's a wild card. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Look at doubles with Ash Barty. What a combination. There you go. <laughs> Ruth, keep making research sexy. It's absolutely brilliant. I, I absolutely love it. Andy, um, we're going to chat about Lionel Messi and how we can get him on board, okay? Thank you. Over to you, Ryan. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Mel, um, for leading that wonderful panel. Um, we really appreciate your support. Um, so that's just a wrap for us. Um, one last message I would like to um, leave people with is that um, the sports sector here in Australia is very much um, embarking on their journeys towards LGBT inclusion. Um, this is a good first step. So we would invite you as an organization um, to engage with the resources, reach out to us, work, collaborate, partner with us. Um, we can make this journey easier for you and we can prepare you with the right um, and correct information and resources um, to do that. So thank you once again for tuning in. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists um, and um, wherever you are in Australia, um, have a wonderful week and please um, embark on your journeys and, and engage with us. So thank you and